Hello YouTube, welcome to Mr. Natchel's Music School here in San Francisco, California. I'm Mr. Natchel. Uh, the first thing is people have been sending me emails saying, Mr. Natchel, your beard gets in the way of your shirt, so I can't see what's on your shirt. So what I'm going to do is uh, show you what I do when I go out to eat. Those of you who have a long beard and have this problem, if you go out to eat, all you have to do is take your beard and tuck it inside like this. And then when you eat, you won't be eating your beard. <laughs> I've got a lot of hair in my food, but this stops it. So welcome. Today, we're gonna to talk about the staff. I'm gonna give you a brief history of the staff, what happened, how it evolved, and why the things sharps and flats and clefts and things like that were invented, what they solved, and then as time went on, what problems they became. Because many of these things solved problems for a couple hundred years and then as music developed they actually started getting in the way. Next week what we're going to do is we're going to cover the staff and the ABC system which is called the fixed system and then the following week we're going to talk about the one two three or intervals which we call the movable or solfege system. So this week it'll be about the staff but first please go to your Amazon.com or to Lulu.com and buy a copy of my book, Music Theory Decoded Strictly by the Numbers. This is a music theory book, and those of you who are in college or studying music theory in a school will find this the most valuable Bible you have ever had. This explains it in the simplest, clearest terms. You can open the book anywhere and start reading it, and all the information you need is in each part. You don't have to read the whole book to know what's going on from section to section. Each section is clearly uh, defined and delineated. Also, you will find in the dibbly doo underneath, down there, uh, in the description, we are putting a link to a thing I call the intervalometer. The intervalometer is this device that we put here, it's a strip, that we put behind the black keys on a piano. And if you have one of these, it fits behind the black keys on the piano, and then it clearly marks the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the numbers for the major scale. And you'll notice that some of these are blue. The blue ones are for the blues scale. If you flip it over on the other side, you will see there's a red slider and in the intervalometer. And this red intervalometer gives us the three different minor scales. The numbering are the natural minor scales, uh, the red 7 is for harmonic minor, and the red blue and red 7 are for the melodic minor scale. So with this, you can actually visualize and see on any keyboard the five different scales that are used. Now there's also the uh, Pythagorean scale, which we'll discuss a little bit later on next week and the week after, which is the five note scale, and it came first. So we're going to talk about it a little bit today. Um, uh, so that's it for commercials. So please support us in any, any way you can. We would really, really, really appreciate that. So the staff. So what happened is from 50,000, 60,000 years ago, the early Aborigines were going through the jungle and they saw these eucalyptus trees and they had termites that would eat out the, and hollow out the inside. They liked to eat the, uh, the core what's called the marrow of the tree. And after a while, these huge limbs would break off. And when the limb broke off, it would have been hollowed out by termites. And the Aborigines discovered that if you pick it up and uh, blow in one end of it, you could get a tone. And that tone was rich with overtones and upper tones. And then they began to create sounds with their voice of sounds of, uh, of dogs barking, songs of birds, songs of crocodiles, and stuff like that, and they were able to start producing melodies. In the African areas, what happened in the Serengeti Plains and things, um, primitive people discovered that they could take a bug, like a, um, a bumblebee or a cricket or something like that, and with a huge blade of grass, they could tie that cricket up and hold it in front of their mouth, and the cricket would buzz, and by opening and closing their mouth, they could change the tone of the buzzing, and they found that they could produce about five notes that way. The problem with this early primitive instrument is it could not be tuned. 
and you couldn't have four or five of them playing together because there was no guaranteeing that they would be in tune. Later on, the bugs developed into just simply a blade of grass that they put in their mouth and they would blow on it and got what we, uh, what we now these days uh, refer to as these, um, these little devices we put in our mouth and hum through. And so they became the earliest harps, uh, uh, juice harps that we know of. And if you look around the world, there are maybe two or 3,000 different versions of the juice harps, right? And then we have these, um, I forgot the name of it, Angel, the, the thing you, you hum into. Kazoo? Kazoo. A kazoo just basically is a hollow tube with a hole in it, and then they put some kind of a membrane, a thin piece of cellophane or something on that. And when you hum into it, it amplifies the sound. And again, people could get about five notes out of those. So these little simple five note scales started becoming more and more common. Then, of course, percussion began happening. And as percussion happening, percussion did not happen in the beginning for musical purposes. What happened with uh, percussion is it was used as a, like a bell in the church. When small towns were developed, the first thing they do when they build a church is in the steeple, they try to get a bell of some sort, and that bell was used to tell if there was a fire somewhere. Also, in small tribes, the kids would wander around in the forest, and the forests were so thick they'd get lost. So it was very common to hollow out a log and to tap out a rhythm on the log when you wanted the kids to come home. It's a way you could call your kids who were deep in the forest to get home and they could listen with their ears which way the sound was coming from and had a way of getting home. Now as populations became more dense, what happened is you didn't want your kid wandering into some other camp because it could be an enemy's camp and he would be for dinner, not invited to dinner, but would be dinner. And what happened was <laughs> it became really important to the parents to start tapping out different rhythms. So different rhythm patterns tapped out on logs and, and early primitive drums were a way of telling your kids where your village was so they could listen and get back home. And this form of community, uh, uh, community communication became more and more prominent. Later, people discovered that they could just play these drums for fun and to help produce music, and they found that they could beat on their log along with the guys who were playing the bumblebees and start getting primitive music. And so the first thing we had was percussion and some kind of scale or melody, and this began to develop. People would back then uh, had really good memories. The amazing thing is the further back we go in history, we noticed that people had better and better, better memories because there was nothing written, there was no printing press until 1600, and because primitive writings didn't start until somewhere around the hieroglyphic and the early cuneiform period of time, these people worked everything out orally. And what they would do is they would describe something to someone else and then they had what was basically an apprenticeship program. You had a person who had some expertise, let's say, in building huts, and then someone would work with them for many, many years, and as this apprentice worked under them, they would learn the language that they needed to learn to become a blacksmith or to become a carpenter. And then as they learned this language and they learned to use these tools to build, what happens is these apprenticeship programs began to happen and everything was explained orally. And these people had really good memories. And what happened is as time went on, they, we developed a legal system. And in the legal system, we needed witnesses. And it turned out that some people in town who had really good memories and could remember things orally very well were automatically signed up to be professional witnesses. And these people were brought into court and they would listen to the court trials and they would memorize the stories and they would memorize the dialogues and the things and they would be called in as expert witnesses. So it became very prominent within the society for people to pass things on orally back and forth and to really develop a good memory so you could remember things. And people with really good memories were considered very valuable people within the community. They were the most objective people around at the time so you could get your facts from. Well, as music developed, the same thing happened. <coughs> music, uh, people started developing simple melodies in their tribe that was unique to that tribe. And then what happened is that person would have an apprentice that worked under them that would learn to sing those melodies. Now, 
Most of the melodies back then also were simple histories of the families. And in a village, you often had a witch doctor. And the witch doctor was usually the leader of the tribe, not just the spiritual leader, but was also like the chief. And their main job was to memorize or to remember everything that went on in history in that tribe. And as a family had a child and it would be named, a story would be made up about that family and a story would be made up about that child. And then later me melodies would be attached to that or little songs would be attached to that. And what the witch doctor did is the witch doctor learned all of those melodies and all of those things. So when they had these huge tribal get-togethers and gatherings, people would get together and each member of each house would sing their family song. The witch doctor would also sing the song and then er have everyone in the tribe echo back. And the first form of music called question and answer or call and response began to happen. The witch doctor would sing a little melody about the Johnson family and then everyone in the tribe would sing it back. Then they'd sing the melody about the Forgot family and then everyone would sing it back. And this idea of question and answer, call and response began to happen. We still had mostly at that time though what we call plain song in which people soloed a lot. There wasn't anything in terms of bands except for drums. Drums could get together and they didn't have to be tuned and you could get little drum lines going and that was quite fine. But you can see what happened in history for about from 60,000 years all the way up to about, I think it's around seven or 800 AD is people didn't have any way of writing these things down and they passed them on orally. And it required having a really good memory to memorize what was going on. Somewhere around the ninth century, um, just before the ninth century actually, people started passing these things on using a thing known as solfege. So a lot of you have heard of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, ti, la, so, fa, mi, re, do. Well, that's a way of singing the scale in Latin, and that scale is movable. I could start do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, or do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, or do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. So it was relative and it could be moved into different pitches around. So we called it movable do system or soul fetch. And what happened is they used this system of do, mi, so, do, so, mi, do as a way to learn music orally. And people would sing these syllables to their apprentices and the apprentices would learn that and they would learn to sing it as well. There was no way that this stuff was written down. But around the 10th century, a guy by the name of Otto of Klugny, who was basically a publisher and read some uh, books or some handwritten scripts by, Ar for, by uh, both Archimedes and, uh, and Euclid, was interested in Euclid's idea of geometry. And in, Euclid had discovered a way of taking things like the alphabet and taking lines and triangles and circles and labeling the corners A, B, C, D. Then he could take these A, B, C, Ds and he could look at the relationships mathematically and start writing formulas. And then he could move this formula around and do some kind of math conversion with it. And then lo and behold, you would get a formula that if you then drew out, you could change a circle into a square. You could find lines that dissected things. You could take triangles and bisect them or trisect them in various ways. And it turned out that the geometric shapes that people were looking at could be formalized as formulas, and then those formulas could be passed on to these uh, apprentices who can then decode the formula back into the actual geometric shapes to build and construct things. Get the point? So what happened is that began happening with music, with the do re mi system, and people started going from oral to being able to want this, write this down. Well, Otto of Klugny, being a publisher, he thought, well, you know, nobody has explained or written a book about music or music theory. It's being passed on with this do, re, mi, solfege thing. And you're seeing it in India where they say, uh, I think they say do, uh, do, re, sa, they have sa, fa, da, ba, 
or some other type of language. You see in France and in Turkey, they had their own language, but it basically came back to this Latin eventually. And what happened is Otto Kludney said, well, if he could draw some lines and label them A, B, C, D, E, F, G, what if I did that? And then started writing a book on music theory. So he wrote a book on music theory, and that book became one of the most published documents of that time. And today, Otto Kludney would have been a millionaire. He made so much money at this. So what happened is, in those days, around the 900, I think Otto Kludney was 935 AD. In that day, they realized that they could do something to represent music symbolically. And so the first thing that happened was, Otto Kludney drew a line, and on this line, he said, what we're going to do is we're going to call this point here A. We're going to call this line B. And we're going to call the line above it C. And they had A, B, C, B, A, or one, two, three, two, or Do, Re, Mi, Re, Do. And what happened is this line became a staff. It represented either the tonal center or just some convenient way of notating things. And then little circles were actually, they had these pens that had flat surfaces on them and they could just go like that. And what it did is it created a little triangle shape by just going And then they found later when they needed to have rhythm, they started notating it by putting uh, a stem on top of it and we got the first types of notes that you'll see if you look way back in ancient history. Notes are not round, they're all triangle shaped like this, with the stem coming out of the top. And what happened is he was able to notate three notes this way. Well, we had five note scales going on at that time. And in, um, I, again, about 530 BC, a guy by the name of Pythagoras, who was a scientist, wanted to figure out how these scale things worked and if there was some relationship between them. And he discovered that they had a mathematical basis. And he invented a thing called the Pythagorean scale, which went one, two, three, five, six, one, one, two, three, five, six, five, three, two, one. And what happened is for the five note scale is they found that by putting what they called a ledger line above the staff and the ledger line below the staff, they were now able to notate five notes on the staff. So we had A, B, C, then you could put up here, D and E, and then coming down, A, and you could go A, and then say uh, A, G, uh, A, G, and then below it, F. So now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven notes that I could notate and after a while, this whole thing shifted around until finally people said, wait a minute, let's make this center line do. And what we would do is we would put ledger lines, as many as two of them above and as many as two of them below. And then what happened is they could notate do, re, me, fa, so, la, and also the same thing in reverse, coming down. So now I had one, two, three, four, five notes below the staff, and one, two, three, four, five notes above the, the staff, which became the tonal center. So now we could notate with just two ledger lines, we could notate five plus notes, and with two ledger lines below and above, we could have as many as five notes below and five notes above. And this system was around for a while. It lasted from about the 10th century uh, up until the 11th and 12th century. And in the 11th and 12th century, the development was to start adding more lines. So what happened is they went from one line to two lines. Now, with every line, I've automatically produced a reference point for that line, 
but I also have a space under it and a space above it. So each line can represent three notes. Now this is something that people seem to have forgotten about, as I'll explain in just a little while. And, but what happened is they started putting in two lines, and the bottom line was almost always do. So, or let's just say the number one. Then you had two, three, four, one ledger line, five, ledger line, you could go up to six, six notes. And often what they would do is these first five notes would be uh, do, re, mi, so, la. How about fa? Do, re, mi, no. Do, re, mi, so, la, which in numbers would be one, two, three, five, six. There was no four and there was no seven. They only had five note scales. And these two lines did a really good job of representing the tonal range. But as time progressed, we realized that we had four basic voices. You had sopranos, you had altos, you had tenor baritones, and bass singers. And that this bandwidth needed to be covered also. So what happened is they began just adding more and more lines to the system. So they started building the lines up. And they wind up with three lines. And later on, you'll see this, they had four lines. And all, in every case, the bottom line here would be Do. <coughs> if they wanted to go below Do, <coughs> they would usually use just the ledger lines to represent what was going below Do, and the full lines to represent the score above. Then, as time progressed, what happened was, because of these four different types of singers, or bandwidths, Eventually, everybody, let's say that everybody sang in the key of C back then, roughly, somewhere around the key of C. Some from the uh, creations that Pythagoras had developed, he found out there was mathematical relationships between these notes. And the mostly singers back then were male, males, and males can sing in C and D easier, and females sing in G and A easier. So what happened is the key of C became dominant. And Otto of Klugny came up with this idea where he called, there were early keyboards around at that time, and he called, he started using the alphabet A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And this system, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, became prominent and was published in Otto Klugny's book. Now, the reason he used the HI is the scale then went C, D, E, F, G, H, I, C, D, E, F, G. There was only one case, just one case of A, B. Then there was C, D, E, F, G, H, I, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And there were, those were seven note scales that were built into the white keys on the keyboard. And you'll notice that on the keyboard today, the modern keyboard, when you have a full keyboard, that C is not where it starts. On modern keyboards where they have shorter four octaves or five octaves, they often start with C. Then you'll have the two, two black keys, and then you'll have your E, F, and then you'll have three black keys on up all the way, all the way on up the thing, and then they'll end on a C. But in the older piano keyboards, or on the grand piano keyboard, you'll notice that there's two white keys below. So C became what we call C1, the first octave. And these A and B below were called A0 and B0. And to this day are still labeled A0 and B0. And then you have C1, D1, E1, on and on and on. And as time went on, people started dropping this because they realized that what happened is uh, A and B0 could be put in here as a bridge between, and then we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven notes, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven notes, then we would put the AB here, and you could see the 
system of ABC that we now use to this day finally evolved, going from A to G and the whole process starting over. And that's why in science and when people talk about it, it's weird because they talk about A0, B0, C1, D1, D3, all, G1, A, uh, A1, A2, a B2, a B1, and then this is C2. Then you go up to A2, B2, and then C3, etc. So what happened is this, instead of being an odd man out, was incorporated into the system and by getting rid of the HI. Now, the nice thing about the HI is people like Buck could spell their name because their name was B, we had that, we had an A, we had a C, but there was no H in the system we have now. But there used to be an H and an I. And what happened is, by using that old system, Bach was one of the first musicians in history that we know of that would write music and actually had a musical signature. He had a little, let's call it a tone row or a little serial row that he used to write his name into every piece. Then if someone copied it, his melody, he could hear his name in it, knew that he was being plagiarized. <clears throat> this system continued to develop. Uh, however, we still had basically two or three lines. And what happened is everybody called this C. And as we it developed into three lines, et cetera, et cetera, they didn't have uh, a way of writing in other keys. So there were these guys who had these things called typecases. And in the typecases, they had little, little tiny blocks that had carved out the A and the B and the C and the D on them. And they would pull out of these typecases and then put them together in the, 16th, in the 1600s and use them with these things called printing presses that developed, that started to develop presses. So what happened is they looked in there and they had regular letters. So they had small a, they had b, small b, they had small d, they had small e, etc. And they noticed that this was the one that had a flag on it. And if they italicized that, if they tilted it, it came out looking like that. And the first accidental that we know of, the small letter case, a italicized B, was used to create what we call the first flat. And what happened is the word flat starts with what? F. So what would happen is over here, if they put a flat on that first line, that meant that this piece was not in the standard default of C, but it was the key of F. So this became one of the first markers that was used to say that we weren't in the natural key of C anymore. We had moved up four notes, and this F, this flat, was used for sopranos and altos, where the normal C was used for the, for the uh, baritones and the basses. What happened is, this system began to develop with more and more and more lines until eventually there were so many lines <coughs> that nobody knew where the scale started. Because of the flat, they could do that and they could say, oh, that's do, or there's the first note of the scale, or let's, for now, say there's A. And what this does, it's actually, this wasn't A, it was F. There's the F. And now this little thing became a little marker that told them where they could start. And what happened is this marker could be moved down here, or it could be moved up here, to accommodate these different focal ranges. And then they used a little C. They used the letter C as well, which went through it, to let us know where the one 
where the main dough is at, and then C, C. So you had two things. You had C, and you had the italicized B. This was the key of C. This was the key of F. <coughs> what happened is this created what we call, by the time you get to the 12th and 13th century, you start getting clefs. And clefs were used as a way to define what letter name landed on which of these lines. And as the lines began to pro pro proliferate, it eventually got to the point, if you look at 13th and 14th century music, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. It got up to fourteen lines. And if we count the spaces below and above, we had 15 spaces. So you had 14 lines and 15 spaces, or the possibility of writing 29 notes. Now we started developing things called octaves, octaves. After, 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 after the five notes, we developed another five notes and then another five notes. And what happened is with this 29, we were able to develop up to four octaves. And that four octaves gave us the four vocal ranges that we needed. But a problem began to happen. In the 13th and 14th century, the staff became so huge and so overwhelming that people just couldn't see it. If I said to you, well, here's the starting point, and you'd say, okay, and we'd start getting. By the time we got over here, you couldn't tell if it was there or if it was there. Your eyeball would just, after we get further and further into the music, the eyeball again began floating around, and people just couldn't figure out where anything began or started or end. It was just too massive for people. So what happened is they began a reductionism. They began removing these things and started creating things called clefs. Now, a clef, if you look it up in the Harvard Dictionary, the first definition of clef is key. K-E-Y, key, that's it. The first definition is one word, key. Clef means key. And so we had the C clef, we had our C clef, and we had our F clef, the B clef, Later, another clef developed, which was called pound back in those days. Later on, it was called tic-tac-toe. Later on, it was called hat. Today, we call this hashtag. So you had the small italicized B, which stood for F, and we had the hashtag, which stood for G. And we had three basic keys, C, F, and G. What happened was, these guys got replaced by fancier things. Now, in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, people wrote the alphabet out in extremely fancy, fancy ways. They didn't do things like we do with Helvetica. For instance, three lines and we have an A. The way they drew back then is Gothic. They would put a little swirl come up here and do a little hit, then they would do little swirls like that, and then do a little fancy thing like this, and that would be the letter A. They had these little curlicues on the end, which the Romans referred to as serifs. So you had the basic letter inside with all these little curlicues. And what happened was, back around that period of time, if we took something as simple as G, if we started putting little curlicues on here, it started getting fancier. And then later, they started doing this. And then later, this. The G slowly evolved into this thing which we refer to as a treble clef, because when it's put on the second line of the staff, 
it's in the treble or the alto tenor area range. And what happened was this represented actually the letter G. Can you see it? So inside this fancy Gothic way of writing was just simply the letter G. And to this day, now people refer to this instead of just a treble clef, which most violinists refer to it as, it's also known as the G clef. And this clef started telling people where to label the lines. So we started dropping lines say eight lines here and people would do this and we would know that this line right here would then be the letter G and on that line would be the letter G now uh, the French violin always was lower than the viol the uh, violins that developed later so the French violinist put this little G down here it was down one line and if you needed to write for sopranos, you could put it up here. And what happens is this creates X marks the spot. And you could hang this little symbol on any one of these lines and say, that's where the letter G is. So now we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and the system sets over A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you can see how important this G clef became. Well, what happened is they wanted to replace the C clef. And the C clef, which was like that, became fancy as well. And they started doing fancy Cs like this. And then later people put lines through them like that, like it was um, cents or something. And then it put dots on it. And they found out that this C could then be represented by this thing that looked like an E with two dots on either side. And this became what we call the C clef or the transposition clef. People wanted to represent the letter F. And again, if we do the little fancy swirls here, right and then I go like this watch if I take that away what do we wind up with and this mark here and these two dots here tell us that we could hang that on a line and this thing which is now called the base clef was actually if you just draw these together you can see it's the letter F so now we had these things called clefs. We had a G clef. We had a C clef. And we had a F clef. And now we could take these clefs and we could put them on different lines representing those letter names in that circle of A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or we could go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or we could go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc., etc. And clefs, from the 12th to the 14th century, clefs were made. Now, another thing that happened is people were inventing instruments, the guitar, <coughs> things like Oh, they were taking things like flutes and making them bigger and developing things like the clarinet. They were developing things like the bassoon, etc. Horns started out as heralding horns and then became bugles and then became trumpets and then the trumpets became, uh, 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 became uh, euphoniums and then the euphoniums became French horns. The French horns turned into baritones. The baritones and trombones turned into bigger tubas. And what happened is every time an instrument was created by a manufacturer, the problem was where did it fit on the staff system? So what they did is they started inventing their own types of clefs. So you got clefs that look like that. 
which were a condensation of the sea cliff. Or, or people could draw, here's, here's one of my favorites, the guitar cliff. And you could take the guitar cliff and you could say, oh, the guitar was actually in the key of E, so I could put that on a line right here. And there we had our guitar clef, and we knew this was E, and now we could start. They came out with a trombone, and the trombone, they couldn't decide what clef to use, so guess what? They used all three clefs, all three of them. So what happened is clefs started determining where on the line or space, where, where, where the number or the letter system began. And what happened is they started reducing the number of lines and spaces until they found that having five having five lines with two ledger lines underneath and two ledger lines on the top would give us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen notes. And that gave us two and a half octaves. Now it turns out that most musical instruments that are created are between two and two and a half octaves wide. The saxophone is two and a half octaves wide. The clarinet is three plus octaves plus a few notes. The guitar itself, if you take E, go two octaves up to the high E, go to the 12th fret, that's three octaves of E. And then if you had more than 12 frets, which they do, and you'll notice on the classical guitars, the 12th fret is at the body, and if you look at electric guitars, the 12th fret is way back here, and they go as high as 24, 25 frets after that in order to extend it to a, a fourth octave. So two and a half octaves was pretty common for most of the instruments. So you could build a clef, say it was such and such a letter name, and attach that somewhere here on this thing, and you'd have a simple staff here that would pretty much allow you to write the entire bandwidth of this instrument. Okay. Later, we wanted to, we still had this problem with one person soprano, could, once a soprano could sing two octaves, the alto could sing two octaves, the tenor and the baritone and the basses could sing two octaves, so we needed something four octaves wide. And so what happened is they began doing this thing where out of this plethora of out of this plethora of lines and spaces that we had, they found out that if they went one, two, three, four, five, and then removed that one, and then you had another five here, we could take and we could put the base down here, and we could put the treble up here. And with two staffs, we could notate from here, which is C, to an invisible C that was in the middle. So there are one, two, three notes in between the two staffs that are missing. And then we could notate up to C. So we had C, that's one octave, C to C, two octaves, C to C, three octaves, and from C to C, four octaves. And then they would tie these together with a big bar here, and this became called the grand staff. So you had a small treble staff, and you had a large bass staff, and you could tie the two staffs together, and then because there were three notes here in the middle that was missing, it was easy to see this as two separate eye bites. And now here's the biggest problem in music I see. They always tell you that the staff has five lines and four spaces. And I think you all know by now that's just not true. Because for every line, there's two spaces on either side of the line. So we have a space here, we have a space here, a space here, 
and a space here. So what we have here is five lines and six spaces. And what we have here is five lines and six spaces. So if you somebody said the staff was made of five lines and six spaces, I would have no problem with that. But to this day, the tradition of saying, well, we only think inside the box, so there's four spaces, has held over all these years. And we still tell people that there's five lines and four spaces. We ignore the space on the top and the space on the bottom. Why are the space on the top and the space on the bottom so darn important, Mr. Natural? Here's why. Because when we build the grand staff and put the other up, you have to know that there's three, two spaces here. And the line that's going down the middle is invisible, so the system can go line, space, line, space, line, space, line, space, line, space, line, space, line. And if you didn't know that there's one on the top of the staff and that there's one below the staff, this invisible C is completely unexplained. And you will see nowhere in any music theory book today, any place, where people are explaining why the C in the middle is invisible. I just explained it to you. This is the reason why. Because of the evolution of getting the staff so huge, it's unwielding, and then having to scale it down, scale it down, so to five notes, five lines, and six spaces, so you could represent approximately two octaves for the single player. And then when you have more and more instruments in these four different ranges, you have two of these staffs put together to create the grand staff so you can have four octaves represented here and write orchestra music or write for something like a keyboard. And most keyboards back then, at the time of Mozart and the time of Beethoven even, by the time you get to the 17th and the 18th century, they still only had harpsichords and virginals that were basically four octaves wide. So the simple harpsichord that Mozart wrote most of his stuff on was a four octave wide keyboard. And that's why a lot of composers in those days would go to the orchestra so they could work with a wider bandwidth and write larger pieces of larger works, large pieces of music. So there is basically, in short, I'm sorry this took 45 minutes, but I just gave you 65,000 years of music history here in, in short. And it was from the 10th to the 12th century that the lines were developed. It was from the 12th century to the 13th and the 14th century that the cleft systems were used to take over the system. Now, what happened to the sharp and the flats? One of the major problems with this is today there are four basic clefts that have been held over. You have the out, you have the C clef. We have the bass clef, which is F, and we have the G clef, which is G. But we also had another C clef, which uh, went like this. And then they also made one that went like this. And then they, some people said, well, we need a neutral, one that had no ABCs. So they came up with this. And these clefs here were pretty much dropped. And these three are the ones that are in use. Here's the problem with all of the clefts. These clefts can only be put on the lines. So if I have, I could put a G clef here and you can easily see where that is. I could put an F clef here and you can easily see what line that goes over. I could put the, the alto clef there. I could put the, uh, the C transposition clef there. I could put that there, and every one of those clefts was placed on a line. Not one of them could be put on a space because you couldn't bullseye it or target it well. So all the clefts 
only were represented by lines. If you look through history, you will not find one single clef that can be put on the space. They can only be put on the lines. So from the 14th to the 15th century, people brought back the hashtag, and they brought back the italicized B, or what we now call the sharp and the flat, as a way to extend the key signature. And I will explain that next week, and I will explain the ABC system thoroughly. So, sorry this is the longest video we've done in a while. Thanks for sticking with us. You'll also notice that there is a chat room there next week when you come back, if you're watching this live, you can type into the chat room and it will show up on the monitor that our tech is, that Angel's looking at there. And if the question is about what I'm talking about, she will ask me the question. If it has nothing to do with what we're talking about or you're just saying hello to me or you're telling me what country you're in, that's nice. Angel would like to know that, but we won't interrupt the video to answer those questions. So any questions you ask in the chat that is specific to what I'm talking about, I will be glad to interrupt myself and answer those questions so you can learn to start participating in this, in this live event. The other thing I would like to say is go down there and hit subscribe. You'll notice that we have 200 subscribers. Now here's something you'll find fascinating. We have been on YouTube longer than anybody else. We actually got a YouTube account, oh, back in 2005 when YouTube started, and we did nothing about it at all. I never tried to get subscribers. I've never asked anyone to subscribe. I put videos up there, and I told my students to go to those videos as a way so I could work or extend these lessons outside of the classroom because I only have a half an hour or an hour with the students and I can't cover a lot of the music theory things that I wanted to cover in class because we're busy learning to play an instrument. So I put those things up there and only our students were using it. So no one subscribed and my web page has been up there for over 10 years now, 11 years now, and I've never asked anyone ever to subscribe before, but I'm asking now since in the future here, well, who knows when this will end, and I'd like this information to be preserved on this site. So if you could, and you'd like to join in on what's happening here, please go down and hit the subscribe button. And let's see if we can get that 200 subscribers that I've had for 11 years now up a little bit, high, <laughs> up a little bit higher. And please email this to other people. Get some of your friends to subscribe because you're gonna hear things here that you will not see in any music book anywhere unless you read 15 or 20 books on music history. You will see approaches to music here that is not anywhere else. And when I started this thing 10 years ago, I went online at that particular time and looked up how many people were teaching music by interval and there was only one person in Great Britain besides us and he did not have a method for reading the staff at all and to this day, <coughs> no one has figured out how to teach anyone to read music on the staff, ordinary music scripted by interval or number. We are the only school in the world that explains how to read music and trains people to read music by interval. Now, in the last 10 years, the teaching that we've been doing with intervals is creeping out there into the world, <coughs> and more and more websites are talking about it, and now, if you just type guitar lessons and you see the one million guitar sites pipe up, pop up in front of you, 80 to 90% of those will still be teaching the ABC system, but 10 to 20% of them now are teaching by interval or by teaching by numbering things. So what's happening is the world, we knew 50 odd years ago when we began this, that it would take between 50 and 100 years for the system to catch on, and it's just slowly catching on. But if you want to find the place where it originated and where this all started, come here. And if you want to see it taken to its ultimate conclusion, which you will not see anywhere else, hang in here with us. Next week, I will be describing the staff system using the ABC system, using these clefs to name 
lines and showing how the ABC system, which is what everyone is teaching, works. So please join us then. Till then, have a good night, good evening, be well, peace and love in your life, folks. The X up at the top. <laughs>